Well, good morning, folks. As a kid who grew up in South Monterey County and has been to this rodeo grounds many times, when the rodeo is happening, I can tell you this is the safest I've ever felt walking around that arena this, uh, this week. So we're super excited to have everyone here for Fear USA, the Salinas edition, version two, and super excited to have this panel to kick things off. Really wanted to introduce everyone to one of the two crops I think is doing a spectacular job of getting automation work through the industry perspective, the university perspective. If you think about strawberries and the work that Driscoll's has done with the Strawberry Commission, that Cal Poly's done with the Strawberry Center, and we've got a start up here to tell some of the examples. I think everyone in vegetables can learn from what the strawberry folks, and I'll give a shout out to the Washington tree fruit folks, and as Hanrahan and her merry band of pranksters, um, those two crops are doing a great, groups of crops are doing a great job. So today we'll talk strawberries. I'm gonna let the panel introduce themselves and give a little bit of a snippet on kind of where they see the problem statement for automation in strawberries, and as importantly, um, what they think we're doing well about it real quick to get things started in strawberries. All right, cool. I'll start off. My name is Andrew Wolf. Um, I work for Driscoll's. Uh, I was and still kind of am the, the product leader for uh, strawberries uh, with Driscoll's. That relatively means that I do strategy, oversee the P&L for our strawberry category. I have done so for the last six years. I've been with Driscoll's for about 16 years doing various things in different geographies. But what we've seen over those last six years really coming on board in 2018 um, was that was a time of huge, huge volumes in strawberries, big, really healthy volumes, but really low pricing. Um, the dynamics, you know, of costs were certainly there, and it was a big focus area, especially with harvest, but overall labor, and then other costs as well, really rising. Over those last six years, what we've seen um, is really not costs going away, costs still rising, uh, maybe not as dramatically as we thought, but certainly rising, about 10 to even sometimes 20% on harvest costs and, and non-harvest costs, which is significant. But price and demand has also risen dramatically. Firstly, about the pandemic, people eating at home, strawberries continues to be the gateway to the overall produce aisle, um, berries in particular, uh, which is that demand has not only, you know, not subsided, but it's still been pretty sticky with consumers uh, even over the last couple years. So that's buoyed the overall category and we've seen really healthy margins. Projecting out, which has been really my job uh, along with a lot of other people, uh, next couple years, we see margins really tightening um, as demand still stays strong and prices still stay strong, but costs really continuing to rise. Um, and on the labor side, which we just heard about uh, quite eloquently and articulately uh, on, those uh, on the cost side and technology. Where technology can play a role, uh, we've tried to you know, have various ways of, in which we've invested uh, directly with startups in the past, indirectly, Strawberry Commission, uh, Cal Poly uh, does a great job and, and others, and, and also with ourselves uh, and our independent grower model. Uh, and trying to get, you know, be a harbinger for our direct growers. And sometimes our growers push us in a ways of automation as well. So see demand rising, um, cost rising, and, and looking at that consistency of supply is also of very, very big importance. Uh, so whether it's harvest aids, you know, automation in that space, or CEA, as we talked about as well, and indoor farming, uh, how that plays a role uh, right now and in the long-term future with climate change and other, other challenges. Uh, those are the big challenges that we see in front of us. Um, and we're, we're excited that we get to partner with some really smart people uh, to take on those challenges. There you go. Nice. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mushtaba Ahmadi. I'm a, uh, I'm a senior engineer at California Strawberry Commission, and I have a uh, joint appointment with Cal Poly Strawberry Center. Uh, over there, we're working, I'm part of the automation program and working on different automation projects that are helping with uh, labor cost saving for growers, uh, like runner cutting or uh, some other projects that we're working on, operator aid, some other projects as well. One of the issues that we're seeing is that um, most of the startups, they're trying to work and start investing on uh, harvesters, which is very important for growers. But at the same time, 
uh, we're noticing that every single of them are struggling really uh, making it as a machine that would really benefit growers, so they won't get adopted by growers. And they're always uh, wondering why this is an issue. I mean, all those growers have problem with labor and they really want these machines. But at the same time, they're not adopting. And the simple answer is that they're good at the very early stage of the season. When it comes to month of June till like September, October, they're out. They won't be able to perform as good as what growers are expecting. So um, what we're saying is that growers at the beginning, while uh, you're at the developing stage, they're very flexible and easy going with you. And they'll say, yeah, if you do like a 60% performance, you're good. But when it comes to the real deal, when you're really saying that I'm ready to really test it and make it as a product and sell it as a service to you, they get binary. So either you're doing it 100% the way that they're expecting or you're out. There's nothing in between for growers because they're kind of, they get scared at that time that if you're doing it wrong, in a, if you're doing it in a different way, that they might lose money and they don't want to risk it. It's a huge risk for them. So for that reason, that's, that's a problem most of these uh, companies are uh, struggling with adoption. And usually when they come to strawberry fields, they um, check out the strawberry fields at early stages. So it's very easy. All of the plants are small. Like they say, oh, yeah, that's easy. We can work on it. But they don't know what's the biggest challenge is to, I mean, girls don't really need any automation help at that time. The most help is needed when the mm, uh, canopies are bushy. So like if you, if you look at the number of uh, the workers that they hire, I mean, it, it rises up as the season goes further, like even like in June, July, it goes higher, but the production is not really rising up. It might even decline at some points. But the issue is that since the canopy is getting bushier, it's, it's getting harder for really finding and seeing the foods to pick them for even the humans. So that would make it even much worse for a machine to really perform it. So we believe that the best solution would be working on a pruning system that would do the, uh, good deleafing and also like runner cutting, all those extra uh, organs that plant don't really need them. And they're just consuming all the nutritions and like make it so bushy that would uh, kind of make it hard to really see the uh, fruits or anything around the plant that are important to be, uh, to be visible for, uh, for a person who's working on it or a machine. Nice. Hello, everybody. My name is Adam Steger, and I'm the founder and CEO of Trick Robotics. And we're helping farmers control pest and disease, but we're using ultraviolet light in place of the chemical pesticides. And it's really related to one of the things Jennifer pointed out. Uh, there's, there's so many resistances these days. And between that and then also the constraints on regulatory, they're really losing a lot of the chemicals that they had used in the past. And a lot of them aren't working very well anymore. So for me, I, I'm coming from a robotics background. And I just wanted to solve a really important problem in the world. So I kind of took the approach of let's, let's actually talk to some of the experts who have been in this industry for a long time and see what types of problems they're trying to solve. And I ended up finding that there are some researchers that spent you know, decades, really, uh, trying to use this ultraviolet light as a replacement for the, the chemicals. So I thought that was something that would be a lot easier to automate than some of the more complex things. And doing my PhD, I, I did a lot of demos where it worked that one time, and that was a really great video. Uh, but I know, <laughs> practically, uh, it needs to work very reliably, especially on the farm. And I've been really lucky because if you come at it from that approach, a lot of times these people have a lot of connections to the farmers. And because they've done so much research on it, the farmers are kind of like, when are you going to get this to me? You know, like, when are we going to have this in a way that's really practical at a commercial scale? So we decided to really take the dive, um, not, not holding the hand, but kind of holding the hand of some of the people like these guys on stage because they were kind of guiding us in the right direction. So using that, uh, that skill and autonomy with the help of both farmers and researchers to, to launch that technology uh, in a way that's commercially viable. So I think that's something that uh, the strawberry industry is doing exceptionally well.
Perfect. Well, great, great intros, folks. That's really a great start. Um, and Andrew, we'll start with you. So as you think about uh, what Strawberry Commission has done, obviously you guys are a key part of that. How do you evaluate the investment in and, and priorities for Strawberry Commission and then Strawberry Center at Cal Poly? How do you decide what Driscoll's is gonna do inside and what maybe the industry can approach uh, as a group? Yeah, so I mean, we like to take kind of more portfolio look at it. Um, and we see what, we've, what Strawberry Commission's been able to do, which is tremendous, which is bring a lot of industry leaders together, um, take a lot, of kind of a lot of the questions that we're dealing with, uh, and then be able to direct resources here and there, which is terrific. Uh, and also gain a lot of feedback and outstanding data uh, that they've been able to collect. Um, Cal Poly has been really a leader in not just Harvest, but really kind of looking at uh, bringing together different investments. I spoke to a couple of different growers uh, before coming up on stage on where do they see really Cal Poly kind of leading the charge. And it's really been able to take a lot of technology and be able to uh, say, okay, does this work for real growers? Um, does this really kind of take advantage? And where are the things that we, we could improve? Uh, and then give that feedback you know, back, which has been tremendous. In a lot of ways, like that whole portfolio, we've been able to say, okay, what are the other growers? And sometimes, you know, we have to be very clear, we're leaders in, um, in some of the technology and oftentimes our growers are coming to us and saying, these are the problems that we're seeing or these are the things that we're al already trying to solve. And, you know, uh, you guys need to take a look at this and be able to solve it for our entire Driscoll's family of growers. Uh, and then there's a lot of times where we say this is too important. We also have to show it, share it through the Strawberry Commission to other growers as well. So it's really kind of a portfolio approach that we try to look at. Um, the trouble is, I mean, we really see uh, us trying to be, you know, much more consistent across the board. The consistency itself is not just of supply. We live through it right now uh, with the rains throughout that dropped out Oxnard and Central Mexico had to come on board and uh, in a much bigger way, which they did, which is great. Um, so that have big delays, so the inconsistency with weather is always gonna be a part of it, climate change in a longer term future, but also the inconsistency in quality um, and quality as it gets to market. Why have we not seen a lot of innovation where you know, you see lettuce and you see, you know, a lot of others that have been able to, you know, take a highly automated system right directly to the fields. It's because we're dealing with a real sensitive crop. We're dealing with a real sensitive crop that we have to ship across the entire continent uh, to our consumers very, very fast and have an incredible cold chain and be able to, to be very delicate with it all the way across the board. Uh, which Taba really talked about this and w was alluding to this when he was saying, I mean, it's not just about, you look at the full P&L and you go, okay, harvest. I mean, that's where the big costs are. And that's where a lot of the drive's gonna be. Uh, but where these guys are really attacking it is not just on the harvest side, which is really a big, you know, it's a big part of it and that's where the big apple is, but it's all the things around it that need to happen for that to work out well. And that's canopy management, that's growing a healthy plant, um, and making sure that that's a consistent plant overall. All the things that go like around that and then making sure that we're you know, growing it possibly in substrate and other, you know, other areas. So it, we understand that it's not gonna be just Driscoll's. It's gotta be Strawberry Commission, it's gotta be Cal Poly, it's gotta be a full ecosystem. You know, even all, all the way to pack lines and how we pack fruit and all the drops and the sensitivities you know, on the other end of the value chain. Uh, and then the cold chain all the way to consumer. We know that the full ecosystem is gonna be need to deployed and we're gonna have to talk with each other much more often, collaborate with each other, share a lot more information uh, if the demand, which is continuing to rise, if we're gonna be able to meet that with consistency and supply and consistent and, and also managing the costs so that growers have margins and are able to reinvest and continue to grow to meet it. Um, so that's how we look at it, it's a portfolio, and we continue to engage with these guys on various areas where they're exceeding and performing really well. And, you know, we can't say that it's a one solution kind of thing. Perfect. Thank you. 
Uh, Mustaba, uh, as you think about the Cal Poly side of the portfolio, there's a lot of activity sets you could work with. There's a lot of startups you could work with. Uh, how are you deciding which startups to work with? And I'm curious, how many startups are you working with and what is the breakdown? How many of them are doing Harvest? How many are doing other things? Just so we can get a little sense of scope. Well, the number of startups that are approaching us are not very high. Okay. And I kind of feel like because most of them, they don't know we existed in the first place. And that's a problem that I see because, like, I mean, it's going to really hurt them because they start, gonna, they're, they're start looking for, they're looking for a problem to solve, but they don't know who they should really reach out to. And since they're, they might go into the wrong direction, and that's why I usually see everyone is directly go for uh, developing a harvest. Every single uh, startups that we see, every single one, they start going for uh, going after a harvester. But if they come to us and talk to us directly first, we usually try to encourage them to take a different route and work on other aspects of uh, other applications like uh, pruning. Because we see there's a bigger uh, issue over there. Because if you solve pruning, you're solving uh, for harvesting, you're solving for even UVC application, you're solving for uh, better uh, spraying application you're solving for um, even uh, kind of less disease, m multiple uh, aspects of the uh, production. But how we decide, we usually, we, we, well, we're very welcoming in that regard. We're not like saying no to people. We try to, uh, we try to, we usually, when they reach out to us, we usually try to talk to them and, and explain how this whole thing works and about the strawberry production, uh, about the different practices that growers has. Uh, we usually take them to different fields and let them talk to the growers directly so they get some feeling, some understanding of what they're doing, uh, different kind of fields so they kind of see different situations. And, um, and usually try to guide them toward the path that we believe would uh, end up to success. And well, it's their choice. Sometimes it's a little bit challenging for some of these people to really take the path that we are suggesting. And that's basically because, um, because of the investors. Investors has a completely, they, they have their own, their own mindset because everyone who wants to work in like uh, strawberry, I mean, kind of, kind of develop anything, probably not just strawberry, any, any crop, they look at the UC Davis cost study of, I mean, like strawberry production. And that document is very, it's a great document, but it's mm, written for a person who wants to be a strawberry grower, not a technology developer or an investor. And because of that, they usually come to a huge number with lots of digits, and that's for harvesting. So they get stuck there. They don't even look at anything else. They don't even want to connect dots to see how different operations might really affect the harvesting situation. And for that reason, we've seen uh, startups that came to us, we work with them. They also created like a um, prototype of that, like the Stereo AI. They actually uh, developed the first prototype of, the, of a runner cutter, but they couldn't convince the investors to really invest in such technology because they're all looking for harvesting machine, and that didn't work for them. So they have to change mm, route and take a different direction. So that's one of the issues that we're seeing. Like they, they, get, they understand the problem, these developers, and they really uh, come up with some solution. They really want to solve it. But they, not, they won't get the support from the investors to really move forward. That's, that's, that's a problem that we see. For that reason, the number of startups that we're seeing in uh, strawberry automation is not that high. It's like they start, but they get decline, and then they're out. And that's a problem. If, if we can solve that part and explain it in a better way for investors, then I, I believe we would have a better situation so that these companies would be able to really grow. So like every company that I talk to them uh, regarding, I mean, some of the companies who are working like um, um, on harvesters, I talked to them many times that you should work on a, har on a pruning machine as well. And they understand the problem, they understand what, what I'm talking about, but they're really hesitant just because the funders who are backing them up, they may not agree with them 
in that regard. They don't want to change direction. They kind of feel like, okay, that's as much, because this is not easy. This is not an easy task for sure. It's, yeah. It would be very expensive and it doesn't have enough m money returned back to the investors, but it would affect other operations as well. That's a little bit challenging. I mean, we need to figure out how to solve this part to make it reasonable for investors as well. Andrew, can we just get sturdier strawberries so they can take a little bit We're of the We're working beating? on it. <laughs> Trust me. But keep the taste. But keep, keep the, the taste, taste. <laughs> flavor up there, yields, and really great shelf life. Nice. Got it. Check. Exactly. We got it. Uh, and Jen, sounds like there's an opportunity for us to help the investors understand that, that Harvest is not the only big rock to fund. It's very interesting that you give the advice to go to other places and the investors push back on that. Yeah. Um, and the one example I'll give, and they're in the room, and I'm happy to have them in the room. Um, for those that don't know, Burrow, Charlie Anderson and team, I worked with Burrow, geez, it's been years now, back in Thrive Days, the 20, maybe 17-ish. Uh, Burrow looked at Harvest and decided that's way too hard. I'm going to do Harvest Assist, which is not easy, but is easier. So in that case, Charlie figured it out on his own um, and, and probably got some decent pushback on size of market, but, but figured it out. So good advice to the founders. We'll see, we'll see if the future ones take it. Yeah. So as the founder, at the end of the row, hearing this, how did you find out about Strawberry Center and how is it going? And are there some opportunities to even make it better from your perspective? Uh, well, I think so. I found Strawberry Center because, uh, I mean... I looked. I think that's one thing that a lot of researchers don't do because they get stuck in the lab and they get stuck in this kind of like bubble where they think they're solving important problems, but they don't go out and just ask around. Like I, I went to a strawberry event when I heard about this technology and they told me about the strawberry center. They introduced us to a bunch of farmers. And then all I had to do was reach out to the strawberry center and ask them if this was an important problem in their view. And they quite clearly said that pest control was one of the big challenges that the farmers have throughout the season. So that kind of was a good indication that this was something that could be a problem. And then closing that circle, you need to then go talk to the farmers, of course. And I think one of the big things is, uh, to your point, it's like, well, are we solving a problem that the farmer will pay for today? Uh, because I think a lot of the problems are in, I mean, maybe it's because I have a robotics background, so I have a little bit of insight on what would be in the too hard bucket for today. Um, but I also didn't have much knowledge on uh, the investment world because I was just coming straight from my PhD. So I didn't really know what it was to have like a billion dollar market opportunity and all this stuff. So for me, it was like, what kind of problems do we have that like I can actually start a business on, which means I need farmers to pay me and I need to like get to break even really fast. And I think actually that's something that like Charlie is doing uh, amazingly well, because I think when it comes to bring autonomy to the farm, really one of the best ways to win there is just to get a lot of robots on the farm. Like be the company that gets lots of robots out there solving a problem that's hopefully bringing in reasonable enough cash flow to build a business on top of. And I think, at least I hope, uh, if investors see a company like that, that's going to be a company that they really want to invest in. Because once you put a platform on the farm, just like Charlie has done with Burrow, we've seen there's so much more you can do with it in the future. And maybe those things aren't uh, things that you can stand up an entire business on, but as long as you're solving that first problem, that was enough to build the business, maybe cover your op OPEX to start, then you can start to explore smaller opportunities, but they, they could add a lot of value to the farmer. And maybe it's not a high value item, but the price is the biggest dial. So even if you add a little bit to the price, it's actually really amazing for gross margins. So for me, when I saw this opportunity and talking to you guys and having you guys kind of bring us in as uh, a company that's launching this technology, I think it was, um, it was really the right approach because that way you get advocates in the industry as well. You know, we've got the Strawberry Center seeing the potential for UV, having done a lot of research in the past. They're not, they're not us telling the farmer, they're a third party saying, hey, this is really working in the field. And that's a lot easier because like, I don't have to have a whole sales and marketing department to convince a farmer that we're doing something that's valuable to them. Uh, we've got uh, others in the industry who are able to talk about that technology. And maybe it's not specific to trick. Maybe it's just saying that, hey, UV is something that is really helping uh, on the farm. And we happen to be the company that's com providing that commercially. So it's, like, it's, it's not necessarily... Uh, you know, them advocating for a single company, and I think that's right. You know, uh, the Strawberry Center 
has all of these concepts that they've kind of learned about over time and seen what's failed. And now they kind of can go back to the farmer and say, okay, these are the things that didn't work. And now we've found something that finally is, is looking like it's working. So I think that third party opinion is also extremely helpful. Um, and I really all, all the people like researchers and people who wanna start companies need to do is, is look and go to some of these events. You're gonna meet a lot of people. You can ask good questions. Uh, just really just talk to farmers and a lot of the researchers out there. And you're gonna learn a lot by doing that. I completely agree. And to that point, we talked about this in the pre-call, um, the Strawberry Field Day in Cal Poly is, is acknowledged as a huge success and a huge move forward for the industry. How did that start for those industries that don't have a field day? And, and what are you trying to do with it? And, and how's it working? Because it seems to work really well from the outside. Uh, I haven't been there when it started first. Right. <laughs> so That's I don't fair. know about that part. But uh, the, one of the big thing about the success of the strawberry, um, uh, the f field day is that we try to form, form it in a way that it would be something that girls would connect with the uh, material that we're presenting. So we made it more like a, um, I mean, we have a part of the show in a, like a field that is next to us, next to our center. So the girls can really go and touch the plant work, see it, kind of connect with it. And also for the, like the automation part that we're usually at a different location, kind of close to that, um, we, we bring the equipment there and kind of show it on the equipment and explain it to them. Well, some topics would be a little bit challenging for girls to really fully understand it because it's more advanced level technology. But it seems like when you explain it correctly, they get it and they get interested about it. So, so the, the thing is that one of the key things is that since we are always, we, we, we go um, to the fields and work with the girls, we, take, we usually know what they're really looking for. So we try to speak their language when we are explaining the technology that we're working on, and that helps a lot. So for that reason, every year we see more people coming. Every year, like, the numbers are add, uh, increasing, and we're thinking of should we really expand it, make it bigger event? or not, because like we have some limitations in that space. Like if we want to go more than the numbers that we have right now, we probably won't have space. We won't have enough space over there right. <laughs> at Tech Park. So um, in one thing is that, so what we do is like, um, beside the center that is working on this, uh, is California Survey Commission is also doing some advertisement on that, try to um, bring more people, invite more people into that event. So all of those really helps. And um, girls kind of feel like that's, this is their own event. So they don't feel uh, to be, it's a place that they are not belong to that place. They feel like that's their own event and they, they usually attend. So like it's, it's their own. So that's why it's very popular between the girls. Nice. Could, could I double yeah, back on, on that? I mean, connecting what you, you were just talking about with Cal Poly Field Day and then what Adam was talking about with really looking and seeing. I mean, I would say that how we look at things and how we develop things at, at Driscoll's is certainly on performance. Yeah. Earlier on, a couple years ago, we really invested and we tried to pick a winner um, in the harvest space uh, in Agrobot and really kind of invested heavily, kind of took it on, on our own. And it was not just the technology, technology was great, but also the business acumen and, and how it worked you know, well and didn't, didn't really pan out. We, we also invested heavily, whether it's in you know, substrate, tabletops, or in other areas as well, and trying to kind of do it our own and do it in other areas. We've been successful to varying degrees, but where we've seen most success is where we've actually partnered with those who have somewhat of a proven trajectory and that trajectory and performance that we can really kind of look into on the grower standpoint, you know, bots in the, in the fields, uh, robot, robotics in the fields and actual performance that we can track and we can see kind of adoptive and feedback from our growers, from other growers. That's where Cal Poly, Strawberry Commission and others really act quickly as a conduit for being able to see what's working in the field and that field day really kind of showcases that, brings a lot of people together for great conversations, really big exchange of, of information 
uh, connections, networking, and also just information on performance. And then we're able to partner with Trek or others, I mean, in, in small ways or in large ways, to be able to see performance on the fields, uh, in the fields, uh, and, and then be able to share that kind of data. So those kind of meeting points are just absolutely critical for the scale and the fast, you know, how things are doing, how things are actually performing uh, on the ranch, and, and that gives us a lot more confidence to then be able to go in and stop picking winners, but also, you know, trying to pick it, you know, way ahead and have a crystal ball, but really see the performance, be tangible, not wait till something's totally proven out, but, you know, be on the curve uh, to, to build into. And that's, I mean, that's absolutely critical for us and the whole industry. It absolutely is. Yeah, great comment. Um, Mustafa, back to you on, on one thing I wanted to follow up on, because you mentioned, you know, we've, me we've mentioned measurements a couple of times and, and, and what success. And I think your colleague John Lynn said it really well. He says, Walt, the best ROI we've seen for our strawberry growers is our ability to sort of concierge slash white glove the integration work. So it's not the technology itself, it's getting it into the operation. Correct. Maybe speak a little bit about that part of it, because it, it is, and you've said this, it's so much beyond the technology in some cases, and that's where you're able to measure the ROI in terms of hours saved for the operator by getting that technology integrated. So how, how do you guys do that? Um, so in that regard, so one other thing is that, um, the technology is one aspect of the, uh, this, this, this whole um, equation. But the other aspect is that I mean, you need to make sure that this technology is really working for growers and it's something that growers feel comfortable working with, they understand it. So this, cause, because um, it usually, I mean, when we work on a new technology, we work on something and we want to take it out to the field and test it, growers ask a lot of questions about it. And we try to understand girls uh, and, and answer all those questions correctly the way that they would understand it so that it would make sense to them because it doesn't matter if it makes sense to us. They should <laughs> kind of mm, say, okay, I understand it. So now it makes sense. I want to really see it. For some technologies, uh, they really, like when we explain to them that this is what it is, this is the mm, use case of this, uh, this technology, this could be used at certain applications, some of them get super excited. It's all, this is a, like some of these technologies, like the operator eight that we're working on, this is new to them. And some of them are getting super excited about it that they're saying, oh, we want it, installed in my tractor now, I want it now. And like we were saying, yeah, we're going to work on it. We're working on it. Just, just be patient a little bit more. So um, we try to explain it the way that they understand. That helps a lot. And um, one other thing is that um, since we go into the field and test it all the time, working with the growers, um, that would uh, put us in a position we will in, in a position where we so so like let's put it in this way: we're not isolated in our offices we are in the field as well. We're not just working on engineering problems and s trying to solve a problem and, and doing designing. We're, we're also in the fields and working with growers directly. So that helps us to have better connection with growers. We, uh, along testing our, our own projects, we're also seeing other problems in the field and try to talk to growers, see the reasons behind all those things. And when we're bringing new technology, we explain it to growers as well. So they won't get blindfolded about that. So that really helps a lot for adoption. I mean, most of the time you say, I have a, I mean, I mean most of the companies who want to go into the field, they're not really, um, they, they haven't had much of experience working with growers closely. So they don't know how to explain it. If you start talking with some technical uh, terms that doesn't make any sense to growers, you're losing girls, so they not they won't get excited about what you're saying, and that's the reason uh, you won't be able to get your technology adopted. You need to make girls excited about what you're, I mean, what you're bringing to the fields. In that case, they would do it, it would help you in any capacity as they can, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they want to say make sure that their investment is safe and you're not really damaging, causing any problem if you say yeah. We don't perform well. Then for sure, you will be out. But uh, this, 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 this sort of communication is a lot. Is, is is really important. That's why I believe it would be great for every uh, tech company who is 
really, and, and also investors who are really interested in working in strawberry, come and talk to us as the California Strawberry Commission and the Cal Poly Strawberry Center. Because we can, so like, technology people have their own language, girls have their own language, investors have their own language. We try to be a translator between these people and make them able to understand each other. So we try to kind of be that missing um, ring in this chain to help them connect to each other. And without that, it would be really hard. So like for Adam, since he was working with us, we work with girls a lot. So like part of the Strawberry Center people, they were working on the UVC project. So they were in close c communication with girls. This would help him to establish the connection with girls so now he doesn't really need any of us to go out in the field and talk to girls because he already understood, learned that language. He already know how to explain yeah. his technology to girls. That helps him a lot. So now when he comes to the field day and show his machine, girls would get excited. They go around his machine and ask lots of questions because now they understand what he's talking about. But before that, it would be like, it's like two different people from two different languages. They, don't, they won't be able to talk to each other. So that's very uh, important here. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And, and actually, let's, let's drill in on that. It sounds like Strawberry Center has got kind of the trusted advisor role that Western Growers tries to have as well, which is, look, if you get strawberries coming your way, yeah. send them to us. Yes. We'll vet them. We'll get them trained up. We'll graduate them. And then we'll let you know yeah. when they're ready to come back. That's a huge value yeah. add. So like we have access to every single strawberry field whenever we want. We just one call away from going to the field. Right. But for any other company, that's not that easy because they want to know who are these people. Well, we can easily bring people with us to the field. We just tell them we're bringing like two individuals from this company and they're working on this, this, this area. They are they're trying to learn about these stuff and they, they're very happy about this. They're really welcoming about these things when we take them to the field. Nice. So let's, uh, at, at 23 minutes left, folks, we're going to go off script. We didn't, we didn't pregame this one, but I wanted to come back to the platform discussion, and I want to call out Burrow, who we already talked about, and I want to call out FarmNG as two platforms in the kind of fifteen dollars to $25,000 range that can do a lot of things on strawberry fields. How do you guys envision from Driscoll's perspective, from, from Cal Poly's perspective, Strawberry Center's perspective, and maybe from the startup perspective, how do you envision these platforms being tested, rolled out, different functionalities added to it? Where's the, where's the right role for everyone to play as we think about it? Because if you think about it, if we had hundreds to thousands of boroughs and farm NGs out there in five to 10 years, we would massively win in terms of data collection you could do for stuff. Our next topic of AI, right? We'll talk about that if we can fit that in on the panel. But as you think about these platforms proliferating and as attachments are going out to them and adding onto them for different functionalities, what's the role of Driscoll's? What's the role of the industry through Strawberry Center? And what, what should the founders be thinking about as these lower cost platforms emerge? You guys want to start? Sure. Uh, so I think that these lower cost platforms really enable startups to get to the field sooner. Like we had to build our first, like when we first tested, it was a single row. It was never going to be profitable, but we needed to do that at first just to show the farmers that this could work. You know, it was a half an acre, and the farmers like, I'm not paying unless it works. So then we saw, we showed them that there was this line in the field, but that took a lot of development on our end to get the automation and navigation and the just the robot in general built. Like I had never built anything like that. We just were in the garage, like you know, playing with different sized pieces of metal trying to get them to fit so that it fit on the farm. You know, but now there's these platforms out there that you could partner with one of these other companies and you can test a ton of different concepts like the runner cutter. I mean, that would be a lot easier to develop just the runner cutter and not focus so much on the platform. And to give my opinion also, because I'm a little biased, uh, you know, there's, there's, this, uh, there's different stages of platforms or different levels. And I'd say like we are the gap that fills the top end because there's some problems that are that are hard to solve with the smaller platform. So I think the smaller ones, like the FarmNG platform, for example, is extremely, uh, it's, it's amazing because it's very low cost and it allows you to get this initial robot arm for picking going, for example. 
But then if, to make that practical at scale on a farm, you need to be commercial scale and you need to be, build something that's basically a tractor. And that's what we're doing is we're building a platform that's more that next level up. So I can see people going from some of the smaller platforms, getting proof of concept of some of these technologies, and then uh, coming to a company like us who's got a lot of robots on the farm at a scale that really works commercially. Nice. Uh, well, those platforms are really interesting piece of technology to me because uh, every single company who tried to work on strawberry and for a certain application, they have to build one by themselves. Right. And if there's one, and they usually start small because they want to just test the idea to see how it works. And having these platforms available um, to them, and it would, it would help them a lot because they're saving a lot of time and money and get ahead of their game by just buying one and start developing their technology around this machine and not spending their time on that. Well, later they might say, yes, this was a good start point. Now we need to switch to a different form of uh, platform, might maybe bigger or a different shape. That's a different story. But that would help them a lot to start what they're trying to develop. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that if it's if, it, if they're getting at a stage where it would be grower friendly, I mean, in terms of using them um, and, and being something that grows would be easily work with them and like being fully autonomous and that sort of thing, uh, which we are not having such a thing in strawberry yet, because like farming G is a good one that fits in strawberry fields, but they're still working on the autonomy aspect of it. They're not done yet. If they can yeah. finish it and make it so that it would be easy for girls to play with it and use it, they might also start kind of thinking about different applications like uh, as a harvest aid machine. Uh, so these are all the applications that are available. Um, and like we also got one of those for our own projects so that we can kind of, we don't worry, need to worry about building a platform and just put whatever we want, put it on it and start testing it. So that's really interesting, but I'm really looking forward to the day that they can solve the autonomy part as well. So we don't need to spend time on that part because yeah. that one is, that's not easy as well. Right. And kind of just, just work on like the runner cutter piece, put it on and just use it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be great. That, but these are really, really um, something that is really needed. And especially for like um, small fields, these, because most of these platforms are really small. And for small fields, they really make sense. So you don't need to right. worry about, oh, is it going to be adopted by just big farmers or everyone would be interested in it? No, this is, since they're small and cheap, everyone can easily have one of these machines as long as they can work with it. So they're really nice technologies. We'll know we've cracked the code when Jen's got one on her farm. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Any thoughts that's on the platforms? That's the filter. Yeah, um, right, right. So I, I mean, what a great test. what a great question. Um, I think it's it's kind of like the, the the decision between you know whether you control you know the the rollout or you let the market play and, and you know as it always is it's somewhere in the in the middle of where we should play out because you see different growers that are small smaller growers you've got growers that you know grow on certain levels of you know with certain levels of water or certain you know steepness or I mean different just all these different levels and you could customize it all the way you know mm -hmm. all the way across if you want to go back into history just a little bit um, with harvest aids there's a thing called a Mercado machine and there's mm -hmm. a Colby machine so they're very like pretty tried and true technologies that brings packaging as well as allow harvesters to move forward and get their packaging much much quicker um, there was a harvest aid that kind of followed the harvester uh, along, you know, along the way as well, uh, like mm -hmm. one small bot. So one was very big off multiple rows and all the crew had to kind of keep at the same pace. And sometimes that could be difficult. Sometimes the crew really meshed well together and was doing well. The other one was really kind of more to two rows or even, you know, one harvester and following the harvester. There's a lot of learnings there. Um, some harvest crews, you know, don't always go at the same pace. And sometimes, you know, a harvester also can't have somebody or some bot right next to it 
R2D2, you know, kind of waiting and then bringing the packaging and doing it and never having a rest to just stand up, walk the row, and put the, the fruit back. That's actually a really important aspect of harvesting, especially when you're doing probably the hardest job in, in ag, which is strawberry harvesting. Um, that's really important. So it's harvesters as well as kind of the overall fields and custom, there's gonna be a solution, not for every single field, that would be completely inefficient, um, but there is gonna be some work you know, to what works for different growers. Um, and that's gonna come from growers themselves telling us what's working from startups of them talking to it or we, you know, we talking directly to startups or the overall ecosystem going through academia and going through those leaders in the space, UC Davis, Cal Poly, others, University of Florida, others, um, that really kind of are able to bring people together and say, hey, this is what's working. Let's, you know, let's support this or let's get those robotics in the field and be able to really prove out this concept. Um, and I would say the other thing is, you know, sometimes it's not all about the technology, it's also about the business that goes along with that technology and making sure that that's healthy. If we see that technology that's really working, you know, how do we either invest or support, you know, to move that forward and also support that business acumen so that that becomes a real viable system and a technology doesn't go by the wayside before it has a proven sense. Figuring that out and figuring that crystal ball it's been a big part of my world, but it's you know not an easy thing to do. But there it is. Yeah. No. Great. And and we'll tee up one more topic, and then we'll try to keep the last ten minutes open for questions. And we'll have a mic runner uh, as we get to question mode in about a couple minutes. But I wanted to throw out one other topic we did in pregame. Um, it's 2023. You can't have a good ag tech panel without ChatGPT, right? Um, which is I don't even think a year old. I think this thing from OpenAI came out about a year ago. Uh, and I think there's a couple mega trends that come out of it. Number one, there's massive investment in AI. You see it, folks want the, the open AI type of outcome, obviously, and it's a land grab game right now. So there's massive funding in horizontal AI. That'll, that'll trundle its way down to, to some of the verticals like agriculture. And you see some progress in AI with things like uh, Farmers Business Network doing Norm, right? Which is an interesting tool for input and seed recommendations. And you see some other tools that are out there on the AI front that are verticalizing. So as you think about AI as an enabler for all the technology that's out there, again, the question from a macro perspective is, what's the role of the individual grower out there, the Driscoll's network, if you will? What's the role of Cal Poly? And what's the role of the startups? How can they interact to make AI happen faster or better for strawberries? Take yeah, yeah, sure. No. I can start with this one. Go it's always it. the founder um, that gets to go first. He's <laughs> yeah, the wild yeah, yeah. guy. Wild, wild west. <laughs> I, although I, I'll start by saying AI has been around for a long time in different yes. ways. But if we focus just on the kind of chat GPT uh, versions of AI that are out there in the industry now, I think that these have a really huge potential for acting kind of as almost like a crop consultant where you can ask it questions. Like there's a lot of times I'll ask a farmer that's managing 800 acres like, hey, what did you spray the other day on this section of field? And it's pretty hard to look that stuff up you know, on, on demand. So I think if we can have kind of an enterprise level system where farmers can kind of feed in a lot of information, uh, then it would be a lot easier to have that information at their fingertips. Like, how many acres is, is this plot? Uh, when is the last time we sprayed? Um, you know, maybe even we can go to the level of you know, taking a lot of different farm data and saying, here's my soil type and the maybe microclimate that I'm in. What do you recommend in terms of the varieties? If we talk about someone like a Driscoll's where they have the capability to kind of give that information to their farmers. Yeah. So that's where I would be. If I was a startup working in uh, the chat GPT space, I think that's probably where I would focus. Yeah. So again, the data collection, big part. Yeah, understanding yeah. that data. Thoughts on Same where thing. AI data plays Data collection out? is very important because like, uh, if you want to like get any recommendation from an AI system, you need to feed some data to this system, some accurate data, so that right. because all th these machines are good at connecting dots. I mean, I mean, the more data you give them, it would be easier for them to have a better picture of the situation and come up with a conclusion for what we are asking for. And this is, uh, and, and the data and the quality of data is really important. The amount and the quality of data are really important. This is something that we've been facing for uh, like runner detection, 
because we were using some machine learning um, techniques to do that. And the quality of the uh, images was really important. I would uh, affect it significantly, the performance of the machine, the, the, the network. The better images would give us higher performance for runner detection. The lower quality images would, wouldn't really perform very well. So if we want to collect data and put it in any chart anywhere as a source for an AI system, we need to make sure that we are collecting enough data and with good quality not just any garbage that if you put garbage data you're feeding those garbage data to the right. system it's not a, it's doesn't it's not an expert it's just saying okay that makes sense to me to I mean all these work seems like well i'm going to use this data based on i mean what i've been learned with and just make a wrong recommendation based on that because it's all about the probabilities and if you yeah. feed too much of mm, low quality data you're in you're making the machine able to um, make decision based on those uh, local data. So make sure that you have good quality data in a lot of them. Yeah, no, data is so key. I'll give a quick shout out to one of the initiatives we launched at Western Growers the last year. We did, we did an image library just because we realized it's a lot of work for an early stage mm -hmm. startup to hire an engineer, go out there and, and collect all this data. And we found exactly that. So shout out to Axis Ag and Jason Mello, who's doing a great job leading this now putting a playbook together for three community colleges to help us do the massive data aggregation across the images. So Hartnell, West Hills, and Yuma are, are collecting that. But Jason was saying, I mean, he's, he's had to pull 10,000 images to get 500 good ones. <laughs> and that's a pretty manual process. It's gonna get better, uh, but you're right. So those 10,000 images seems like a great data set. It's not really. The data set you want is the 500 vetted photos mm -hmm. that are tagged and geotagged and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think AI can probably help with that at, bo yeah. at both levels. Any other AI Certainly, thoughts? I mean, I would just say across the value stream, so you have, you know, upwards of how we're you know, developing the plants, how we're looking at the plants, how we're managing the plants, and you know, managing harvest, but all the way down, so that's really clear. I would say data collection in there, all the way to the value, the value chain to our quality department. Our quality department probably collects the most amount of data um, in the company around the actual berries variety, where it's coming from, how the qualities, and what are the quality aspects that we're seeing. And then all the way to the cold chain, you know, down to our customers and the retail space. And that's just going to get better with uh, being able to ask questions and get really better and better refined answers real time. That's not just data collection, but it's actionable data collection real time that can get all the way from, you know, um, Richmond, Virginia, all the way back to Salinas, California to be able to make real decisions on the farm right now, what they're saying, because usually that's pretty old data all the way, way back. Figuring out what variety, what, you know, what farm, is it something that's very specific to that, or is it something more broader of a trend that we need to act on very quickly? I would say AI is definitely gonna help with being able to manage that quantity of data that's just gonna get bigger and bigger as we get better on tracking and traceability. Um, quality aspects. There's also a security aspect. Of it. I just got off the phone with a global mm -hmm. R&D. I'm actually moving positions into an R the R&D space, our global R&D business unit. Um, and so literally just walked off a conference call driving here uh, where our IS team got a big chunk of that global uh, town hall that's across all the time, sh uh, time zones talking about security and talking specifically about AI as well. Um, as we manage all that quality data, all that data that's going through on our farms and everything else, being much more secure uh, around being able to use it as an opportunity and also being much more secure around making sure that that is shareable but also secure to our growers, to those who we want to share it with, is going to be just ever increasingly important as we look food, um, food and uh, is going to very much is a risk and a threat right now, and there's a lot of threats to national security and national food chains uh, specific to our growers, uh, big players like us or, or anybody else. Um, and then I would also say just, you know, I'm, as I move into this global R&D transformation, I'm looking at transforming, helping to transform our farming networks as we do into R&D, and that's going to have to all the way back to breeding, all the way back to our test plots and trials. We're, gonna, we're looking at transforming how we farm, transforming how we look, look at things and develop into these new geographies and looking at, you know, the not the next five years, but the next 50. 
of how we're going to use technologies like AI, but also you know, setting it up to be able to use data and securely uh, across the board at a much faster pace. And if we collect all this data, we just have to be able to use a directory. It can't be Google anymore. It's going to be something like this. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, it's going to be really, really quick. Growers are going to have to use it securely. We're going to have to move it quick, and we're going to have to get actionable data uh, to use it for nice. it to be useful. You know? Yep. So I'll, I'll ask the panelists to multitask and think about our one final thought after a few questions to leave the audience with in the area of strawberries and the collaborative effort that we are undertaking with, with the group on stage. I'll open it up to a couple minutes of questions from the audience if anyone has a question for our panel. Oh, <laughs> of I course. I thought we answered yes, them all. No, we don't have a fear farm yet. <laughs> oh, hurry it up. Uh, you know, not getting any younger. No. Right. Um, but I'm really, I love what you all are saying about every group has their own language, and we need to figure out a way for all those languages to come together and understand one another. Specifically with regards to AI and with chat GTP and whatever the heck else comes from that. Um, how are you talking to growers about that? How, or are you talking to growers about that? And you know, how can you frame it so that they can trust something? You know, can they trust the data? You talked about garbage data. You know, how can you talk to them so that they'll know if I ask the system a question, I'm getting a quality answer that's going to help my operation? You know, has has there been any dialogue around how you're sort of presenting this to growers? I'll, I'll start, and I'll, I mean, I'll say that I, I don't think we're engaging enough with our growers on this, um, and it's definitely kind of a wide chasm. As we share with growers, we're sharing reports on daily, weekly basis. We're creating platforms um, that growers, like an in-grower network, that they can come in and they can grab their data. And then there's also areas where we rank, you know, ranches or growers in terms of quality or yields or other things to kind of say, okay, where are we? You know, where are we going? Where's the relative? Even paying for quality in, in some, some aspects. So there is a lot of data share that needs to be very good and because it's moving dollars. Um, and is also, but in that sense, you know, there's still just a wide chasm of being able to say, you know, not just from static, but something that's very much more dynamic, like an AI that is much more custom, that they can ask questions of their own data that's coming through, again, all the way, you know, to you know, the retail store in Connecticut, you know, back to Salinas Valley or, or Oxnard or Central Mexico or, you know, South America or Peru and other aspects of where we're growing. So that's going to be, we're not talking to them enough about it. We're not creating enough of the platforms that are going to be there. We're just trying to kind of catch up to be more dynamic, but that is a, a leap that we're going to have to take um, sooner rather than later, quite frankly. Time for at least one more. Yep, a question here. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the panel. And my question for you um, ar around AI is about your trust in AI. It's not about AI. And that means that if, for example, we have a robot now, and with AI, this robot can decide where to go, what to spray, when, hmm. how much, is this kind of a level of trust that you feel you have right now to send out those autonomous ag robots machines to take their own decisions based on AI where we don't know where it's going to go, what it's going to do, stuff like that? Um, well, we can say we can trust these AI systems, but, uh, well, the thing is that it depends on what kind of model you're using, because like certain, there are lots of uh, machine learning, deep learning models that are being used some of them are better for certain applications and tasks. Some of them are not. So it's important to know how much uh, research has been done around that topic to see and, and really comparing different um, networks on that topic to see how they're performing. And that's one aspect of it. And also, the, uh, one aspect of it. And, and also, we need to really test the repeatability of these systems. As, as, I mean, we, can, we can trust that when we, if, if we do good, if we spend a good amount of time really doing research and exploring these systems, um, and 
and it also depends on uh, the data that we're feeding to the system. And when we're talking about good quality data, it is expensive. Are we really putting money, putting time, putting right people to do the job correctly or not? Sometimes we're just uh, not patient enough to get that part done correctly. And in that case, we see problems like you might feel like, okay, like with Tesla, they have accidents. I mean, they're an autopilot situation, they have accidents. And that's basically because they, those machines, they, this, the, the, the AI system that they have, they've never seen that s such uh, situations before. So like if you have a huge uh, semi that rolled over on the, on the road, no one took a picture of that situation, put it in the library for the, mm. uh, for the machine learning system and label it that this is a semi that rolled over on the road, so you have to stop. This is not a road. You can't just continue. So in that situation, you would just crush it. So that's why we, have, we are seeing these situations. So we need to make sure that we can uh, predict different situations and have lots of images. Yes, if we don't have enough data, that really support these systems, they're not that reliable. Yeah. No, that's solid. Really good question. Uh, thank you, Mustafa, for that. And I'll, 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 I'll borrow an extra minute from the next panel just to give everyone a final thought. We've started at the end all day. We'll start at the end again. What's your final thought for the audience on strawberries, automation, and collaboration? Uh, it's not just for strawberries. It's for all the crops. Uh, just yeah. researchers, please get out of the lab and just talk to people like this. They're really easy to get in touch with. You're at this event just run into them and ask good questions because uh, that's how you solve the real problems for the farmers. And just make sure that the unit economics makes sense so you're not chasing something that's like so far away that you're not going to be able to get to break even at some time soon. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Uh, so what I usually tell uh, the developers is that if you come to me and tell me you have the best harvesters ever, I will tell that person, you're right, you have the best one, but you're not going to get adopted by the industry. And that's because you won't be able to uh, operate in the field while we don't have a good pruning situation. Your machine vision system won't be able to see anything. Before solving that part, you won't be able to really get adopted. You have to solve that problem so that you can really operate at the uh, kind of a, when the canopy reaches to its maximum size. It all works together. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, you know. yeah. <laughs> Last one is, I mean, I would say, you know, as we talked about performance um, out there, every company, every organization, every university, I imagine, has those early adopters um, and those that people trust. I love the question that we talked about. I mean, it comes down to trust, right, in AI. And I mean, and is that trust there yet? I would say it's not there yet. Um, but there's always going to be those first adopters that, I mean, and I've got my cadre of, of growers that, you know, and other growers look to leaders in this to really kind of be able to prove the concept and be able to see that. Um, I would say, you know, really be able to talk with people, uh, to Adam's point, really be able to talk with people and, and connect with people a lot, but also focus in on who are those leaders in those industries and in those organizations and those first adopters be able to talk to them, um, be able to bring the robots or bring you know, whatever technology it is um, out to those first and be able to prove the concept quickly and really listen to those, qu those questions and what data that they're really asking about to speak that language, what you were talking about earlier. I mean, like speaking the same language so you can say, oh, I haven't measured that yet or I haven't spoken to that yet. Um, because once you get those guys on board, uh, those women and men on board as leaders, and being able to answer those questions, others will really see it and come, come together much quicker because you've built that trust with those. And I see that that's the urgency, that's the, the quickest road to adoption, uh, to getting people around. And the only way to find those, those people are to really ask and talk um, yep. or open a book. Awesome, great close. Audience, let's give the panel a big thanks. Great conversation. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it.